Hi everyone, welcome to Tom's Man Shed. Okay, this is part two of the install of this video camera in the MG ZS EV. Now, hopefully you've seen part one. Part one took you through the reasons why I bought that particular camera and the unboxing of it. I'll put a link to it up here. Where we'll be able to uh, click on it. Or there'll be a link at the end of this video. But uh, hopefully you've seen that first. Um, if you just skimmed over that to come to this in install, like, that's fine. Now, it is specific to the ZS, the MG ZS EV. If you're fitting it in your vehicle, a lot of it will, will still be relevant, a lot of the information, but you'll have to uh, refer to your own fuse box diagram and, and stuff like that. Again, a disclaimer, I can't be responsible for any damage you do to your car if you feel unsure about doing something or not confident in doing something get a professional installer to install it this is just a chronicle of the way i did it in my car and, and it's purely that however you do it is totally up to you but hopefully there will be a lot of useful info in there again it's specific to this camera um, which is a front and a rear camera i start off the video with the installation of the wiring to the rear camera so if you're fitting a dash cam that is only a front camera and you've no rear then you might want to skip through the video and just get to the relevant uh, part which is just wiring up through the front a pillar to uh, to the, the front camera now i totally filmed the whole installation I'd got the cameras installed, I'd started doing some road footage uh, to put on, which I will be doing uh, straight after the, the install. And then I came across uh, something that I thought it could do with an addition. I'm going to explain this right at the end, but this might give you a clue. At the very, very end of this video, I'm going to be uh, installing that, that is an extra. I'll fully explain it, the reasons why, so stay tuned right to the very, very end and it'll be a supplement on top of the uh, the installation I'd already done. So without further ado, let's get straight on with uh, the installation now. So if you just crack these tabs off, pull them forward, that enables you to get a bit of thing in here, but you can pull it there and that will let you see down the roof there and this roof lining is clipped with those clips there so this side panel pulls off this roof lining but hopefully I'm hoping I can get the wire through there already popped that there so I'm going to be bringing the wire up through that through that there through that there and then have this bit which was like that so if you pop that on you'll be able to bring the wire out here and then just cut a little hole in that round there. So I decided to fit the rear cable first, the one from the front camera to the rear camera, um, by first of all threading through these fiberglass rods. Uh, they're very thin rods, you can get them uh, various places for threading wires. And the roof lining just pulls down very easily. It's on um, these like them Velcro type pads, them hard plastic hook and eye pads. And it just pulls down and pops out of them uh, you can see one coming up soon yeah just to the left there so just slowly guide the bits through there st screwing the extension pieces on as you go along well at this stage i've got that blue rod you just saw right near the front of the car and this one you see now is a separate blue rod just on its own that i've taped to the cable and i'm just pulling it through this is just one rod on its own as you see there You'll see the other rod in the background there ready to connect it to. It's then just a, a matter of untaping it from that short rod that it's attached to now and 
taping it to the one you see there in the background, which is the long one from the back of the car. So as you can see, I've just got this much lead coming through here. That's going to be the position roughly of the dash cam there. So the lead will be attaching to it, so I'm going to leave about that much sticking through. And then that's just through to here so far. And obviously I've just got the whole lot coiled up to there, which I will now attach the end to this bit and pull it pull it back that way so that's the um, <clears throat> the hook fitting screwed to the end of that and I'm now gonna screw that on top of there so I'm now just gonna put some of this on some silicon grease just on this bit here so actually that came uh, remarkably easy through there, as you can see, you know, it's, it came through pretty easy. So we've now got the cable up to here. Now there's loads and loads of uh, this cable, it's pretty long, so we're going to have to decide to uh, where to lose the bulk of it. Well, it's going to be at the front. There's no real space inside here to lose the bulk of cable, so I'm going to start threading it through that way and then through that. So again, we've got a bit of spare cable through there just to tie it to. And here's the, the lead. So we're going to shove it through that hole there. going to fit through it. It's a very tight fit. You can see the wires there, they're all sort of like there and white and there they are wrapped. So it'd be a lot nicer if they, they'd have been wrapped as well. But So instead of trying to tape the cable to it like that and take up more room, what I've decided to do is sort of surround it by these cables and tape them all around. It's hard to see while I'm holding the but you get what I mean if you spread them all around the plug you'll get a more central pull that way and uh, it'll take up less room as well. So there it is all greased up ready to uh, through there, let's hope it will fit. It's going to take two hands this, so I can't film it. So I just placed the camera down now, We're not expecting it to film, it's just because I needed two hands, but it is actually picking it up. And if you look, you can see how remarkably easy it was to pull through there. It just pulled through pretty easy. I thought it'd be a lot harder. Okay, actually, it pulled, it pulled through remarkably well then. So uh, we've just got that much through at the moment. Well, uh, so we're getting it through to there. So we're going to have to thread another piece of guide wire down here to do that sort out now. So again, we've got one of them rods through from there, behind there, through to there, ready to tie this to it and then drag it through. So I'll do that now. Okay, so we've got that taped to that now. So like I say, you will be left with loads of um, surplus cable to give you plenty of uh, length. So I was, I still am going to do it at the front, but there's more room for thought in here. You see, you know, that, I could concertina that and a lot more up inside this void without doing any harm, without touching anything. But what I'm going to do is I've already pushed most of it behind here. And you can, you can't 
can I keep pushing? Way around here. And lose all the cables. So basically I've just got this little bit left. I'm now gonna lose most of it behind this void here. And then I'm gonna ne neatly tuck the other round here. And it's clear of any airbags. If I'd have run it here, here is the curtain airbag. I mean, it must blow the entire panel off anyway, these curtain airbags will come out here, I don't know. But, but there is a lot of gubbins in here. If you look at the diagram, again, I'll show you the diagram um, in the, here. Okay, so you can see here on, this is the card that you get with the MG, MG ZS EV. And it's showing you the position of all the uh, the bits the emergency uh, response team, the fire brigade or whatever, would need to know about the car. So these blue stripes here are the curtain airbags for front and back passengers. As you know, they'll come down vertically to protect against a side impact. So they'll come down right up against the glass. Now what you've got to remember when you're fitting um, these cams and running wires is you don't want any wires in front of these airbags as they, as they come out. There are other videos on YouTube saying that it doesn't matter and that they will blow them straight out of the way, um, which they probably will, um, but there's other videos saying that uh, it's important to tuck them behind the airbags. So, uh, for that reason, just to be uh, extra sure, I've decided to run the cable well, well away from there. I'm not running it down this side panel at all. I'm running it more like towards the middle of the roof lining, up against here, clear of the panoramic uh, roof um, electric blind, and well away from these curtain airbags so they would go straight down and it'd be no, absolutely nowhere near this wire um, but running it here the cable here there is a void there we're clear of any mechanism for the blind and we're clear of uh, any any airbags deploying so the choice is yours um, if you want to you know have a go at removing this clip here and this seat belt panel and pulling the lining up and getting it all off here but it is one continuous by the look of it roof lining this there's no joins like a lot of cars are so you'd have to take the whole lot off to see clearly behind it and and pin it cleanly behind any any uh, airbags and, and go in behind there so I've decided like I showed you to run it along here there's nothing nothing here as long as you make sure you clear the the blind sort of mechanism but anything behind here around about this deep in there's nothing there so if we just lose the rest of that cable so i'll make a neat joint to that now and then i'll, I'll show you pushing the, the things back so we've decided we've got enough wire coming out here to go up to any person once we've connected it we can shove it back inside there so it's just a matter now of popping these back in you'll see there's a an extended bit on there so tuck that under there first and then just pop that in there like that. so it does do a pop in it and again with this one, shove that in there. First, and then it's a lot easier this with two hands. I'm not holding a good camera. Make sure these are back. Like I say, you can. Feel it go back up in 
in these clips. Well, that feels solid now. It's covered to put on. So, set that. so at this stage, it's just a matter of um, deciding where your rear view camera is going to go. Is it going to go bang in the center of the screen or to one side? Um, it depends which way, if you look where my finger is showing now, that's the windscreen wiper arc. Now on the MG it's bang in the middle of the windscreen, but some cars it is over a bit to one side or the other. So you may want to put your camera to the left or the right so that it's looking through clear glass in the rain. Um, if not, it's less important on the rear screen than the front, but obviously you want as clear a view as possible. And... Uh, so it's just a matter now of, uh, of deciding where to cut that notch. Uh, you can cut it various methods, a little Dremel, uh, a drill, um, a knife. Um, I've decided to use a little uh, portable uh, soldering iron there and just to melt a little hole in it, tied it up with a scalpel. So it's just a matter now of uh, cutting that hole with the soldering iron. So use any method you like. Um, wasn't quite wide enough for the wire, I don't think. So just widening it up a bit, and you can just trim it later with a, a sharp Stanley knife or a scalpel. I used a, a modelling scalpel. I use for modelling. But, uh, as long as it clears clears the cable, that, that's all we're after. So that looks good enough. You can see it's clearing over there. Uh, it's just a matter of thumping the uh, the shield back into place. That's quite a tight fit, so we can always remove that shield again to lose any of that wire. Uh, we can do that later on, but uh, that's that bit done. Now after screwing this back, them uh, little plastic caps didn't fit that brilliantly. Uh, they don't clip in that good, um, so you may have to use a bit of glue or something on them. And at the top there, obviously, make sure the rubber seal is around the headlining. That's all that uh, keeps the headlining in place, apart from the little uh, Velcro clips for it. So, just uh, checking the rubber now, going around, checking it's all, all in place. So the headlining clips up against them Velcro strap type things. Make sure this is pressed right down to the uh, the bottom there. There's like a white, sticky, gluey type stuff on as you pull that rear rubber off. There wasn't any on the front, but on the rear, rear there was. Um, and make sure it's pushed fully down, and and that uh, that wide bit there that goes over the thin um, strip you've just removed. So make sure that goes over. Just like that, over your uh, your rubber trim, and push everything down as as hard as you can get it. And make sure that goes over that grey panel there, and then you can screw screw your panel back if you hadn't done earlier. And as mentioned before, these clips are a bit awkward. They don't go in that that great. The little tab that securing a uh, bit of stuff tends to push them back out again but anyway they did uh, go back in place with a bit of hard pressing right that's about all we can do at the back for now so uh, let's go to the front okay first of all i used sort of this sort of tool to get under there and sort of push start pushing that rubber strip down it's pretty tight but if you look that sort of groove there where my finger is where that tool is now inserted that front groove there is what goes over that lip so if you once you've got it going a bit it comes off pretty easy this is just to uh, let me try and see where this trim is and this 
bathroom here attaches. So your, your front A pillar cover, again it just levers off there, there's no screws in this. It is a bit daunting at first because you don't know how it goes and it, you can see once you've got it off I don't know whether you can see it, but that stud there, that grey stud, goes in that hole where the tip of my finger is. But then we've got this strap here, we've got a strap here, stopping it coming off fully. And that strap's located in like a grey clip. Once you've got that stood out, and there's another one there, you can see that black one there, that just pulls up, like that, pulls out of slots. I'm going to take that out so we can see it, uh, particularly this, this one here. So this, uh, this stud here, this black stud, there's a pin in the middle of that. Now normally, um, when you pull that pin up, it releases sort of like tension on the little lugs underneath. Uh, you press the pin in to lock it. So I've tried that pin up. I've also tried it in the in position. And it's an absolute swine to come out this. Uh, as you can see, I'm thrutching around with this uh, yellow plastic tool. To no avail. And it's, it is really, really, really tight. The grey one, the grey stud, is out, that just pushes in a hole, but this one is caught fast. But as you can see, we did get it out with that metal tool, so that plastic one wouldn't do, we had to get it out with the metal tool. Now, once it's out, you'd think that, that tab there, as you can see, there's like spring bits there, little spring tabs. Once you pushed them under the slot, you'd think that would pull forward dead easy, leaving that round tab in the hole, but it doesn't. I just couldn't get it out. So the only way was with that metal um, tab puller there. So you may have better luck with the other plastic one. I don't know. Um, right, these things here, there's, uh, you've got this uh, rubber tube here. That will be a drain. That will be a water drain from, from the roof, I would imagine, the guttering around the doors. Um, you got your wires up there to, to whatever. Um, this strap here, I'm not sure what this is, but I would, I would guess uh, something to do with the seatbelt pretensioners. So plenty of room there, as you can see, uh, to get the cables up. This bit here, by the way, is just sound deadening. Looks like an airbag, but it isn't. I can assure you, it's not an airbag. It's just sound deadening uh, padding. And uh, that's where the airbags are, curtain airbags, and as you know, we've avoided them by running the cable much further into the middle of the car. Uh, there's loads of room around there to run our power cables for the front camera. And we can tuck them behind there, as you'll see shortly. So, oh, a bit dark under here, but what we're going to do now is shove this piece of Again, a bit of network cable, but any stiffish wire will do, but not as stiff as them rods. So we can push this through, and you can, I can actually see it pretty easy through here. I don't know whether you can see that, but... bend in it and it's just a matter of threading it through bring it through like that I'm going to use that now to tie the camera USB connector to so we'll be tying that taping that as before to there and then pulling it up through that hole, it's quite a big hole, and tucking it behind here. I'll just put um, some 
cable ties on the cable. As you can see, it's tucked right out of the way of anything. Uh, that's the plug for the speaker. So if we put the panel back on now. Uh, replace that there. So yes, uh, just pushing in until that clicks up. That's your speaker connected. And clicking back, there's your sys connector here. This black one it goes in that hole. And then you've got this grey one here, which goes in one of these holes here. So, so came out easy enough, apart from this top one that I explained. got that panel off. Rubber's here, jangling off till we've got this back on. So, so don't forget to plug the speaker back in. One prong goes down there. Then you've got that black stud about here and the grey stud about here. If you line them up by looking down inside at first, line them up, it's ready to push back now so that should just knock back in place. That's a nice snug fit down there. It's right up to the screen, it's right down to the dash. So that's in place. I've just got to put this rubber back now. Okay, as you can see, the rubber is now back. Make sure it's pushed fully up. And this bit of the rubber covering the, the dash that will go the fuse box in here it's a bit awkward it's better with this sort of face and you can see what's what on this I'm gonna have to work upside down because the fuse box as you see is under there for now we're just gonna push and don't forget to uh, screw back the visor clip that we took off before, making sure there's you're not trapping any wires in the visor clip. If this thing came off before, it's easier clipping it back in now. So if you clip it in now before you put the screw back in. It's easy to mess it about with it. Move so. It just goes there. And up there. And then just try and get the uh, screw in without unhinging the, uh, the flap again. Okay, so I've got my phone here set up, linked in with the camera. And I've got the camera. You can see these are the two leads we've installed. At the moment, I've got the camera just rigged up with a lead direct to the camera going into the cigar, so the cigarette socket, just while I set it up and just while I line it up. So, propose a position. It has to slide off the mount that way to the right. So you've got to leave enough room to slide it to the right. 
and also make sure that the lens is looking through a bit of windscreen that is within the windscreen wiper arc which you can just see there you can see the, the dirty windscreen it helps at this stage to have a, a dirty windscreen really so you can see where where it's being cleaned to so that is that is found about there if I put it to back here it's going to be looking through dirty dirty windscreen so so I think if it's about there so I memorize that position and then I've just got some uh, isopropyl alcohol here on a, a microfiber cloth thing. So that's thoroughly grease free. Now pull the uh, sticky stuff off. position now plenty of room to slide it off to the right and then give that a really firm press down now as you can see this is the GPS mount it's got its own you probably can't see from there but it's got its own little USB socket there and that's where you connect your power lead to. And then it gets, the camera itself gets its power from, from that. If we plug that in now, you can move the lens up and down. That's about right, I think. In fact, one click up. And it's just about getting the top of the dashboard in there. You can control your camera from here, take a snapshot, start recording, go into the uh, the menu. I'll stop recording first. Then you can go, go into the menu, set all the settings on your phone, sat in your lap. This bleeping is to tell you that you're, uh, you've got recording pa pa paused and you're in the settings menu. So go back and then start recording again. So yeah, let's uh, have a look at installing the rear one now. We're now gonna set up the rear camera. So we're gonna need this, connect to the front camera plugged in to the here. But this power lead, this is the power lead now that's leading down to the fuse box, the, the permanently wired in power lead. We can now connect that, so if I take the camera off, we can now connect that for good. To here. Just close that. Took that wire behind there. There's plenty of room behind this uh, headlining. So we've got that now, the permanent hard wire that runs down, down the A pillar into the fuse box, plugged into the, the GPS base unit. And this is the camera going to the back. So we're gonna set the back camera up now. But, so temporarily, since we haven't wired up yet, um, I'm doing it in this order. Normally I would have wired it all this up and then set the camera up. I'm doing it in this order because I'm, I'm still waiting at this stage. Um, which is sort of like half past 12 noon for Amazon to deliver the piggyback fuse connectors that I've totally forgotten. I've got one of them, but uh, remembered I need two for this system. I'll show you that later. So I've had to order some of them from Amazon. So... Wait for them to come. Hopefully it'll be here this afternoon. So meanwhile, we'll wire this up again to 
the power and plug the rear view camera in. So. so, that's that. So, wired up now, just while we set up the rear camera to the cigar socket. Rear camera's plugged in. And this power socket's going direct to the camera. We can now take the uh, the phone off, move it to the back, and I'll set up the other camera to film the installation on the back window. We can't mount it fully back there because we'd have to cut quite a big hole in that uh, that shroud. So I think if we put it between them two heating element lines and then that shroud should still fit over there no problem so this is darkened film now so we're gonna have to cut a little piece of that free so I'm just gonna mark it with a, uh, a marker pen and then cut it free so as you can see I've have marked around it now in a marker pen that's on top of the uh, the film and I'm just going to cut it out now with a, a scalpel with a brand new blade in it. Okay, as you can see, I've now, you see the difference in the, uh, the shades there. I've now cut an area away of film so that the sticky patch will stick. I was going to clean that with the isopropyl alcohol as well, but because the screen was already cleaned before by the guy who applied the, uh, the film, and uh, all that's under it is, is stickiness. It's not going to affect the stick of the pad too much. There's no grease under there or anything. So I didn't want to get any uh, alcohol running under the, under the film and maybe lifting it off. So if you have got film on your rear screen, probably best just to cut away the area just for the, the sticky pad of, the, uh, of this. So I'll stick that on now. And as you can see, you can't, you can hardly tell there is even one from the outside. And there it is, fitted with the lead disappearing behind there. And it goes in there and out there. Okay, so that's the view of the rear camera in situ on the rear window. Right, if we get back to the front of the car now and let's complete the wiring up to the fuse box. Okay, so for some reason the MG doesn't have a cover over the fuse box with a label on telling you what number the fuses are and what they do. Um, it's just a bare fuse box and also it's mounted in the most awkward position I've ever come across in any car I've ever worked on for a fuse box. It's like upside down uh, in the passenger footwell. They're usually facing you so you can actually see what the fuses are and, and pull them out towards you but this is hanging underneath. So for that reason, I found it extremely difficult to uh, film it, uh, particularly one-handed while I'm trying to do it myself. So I just took this picture of, from the, the handbook. And if you look there, that's um, a picture of the fuses with them all numbered. And again, if you look here in the, uh, the handbook, it tells you what all those fuses are. So it's a matter of trying to pick a switch to live, one that's only live when you turn the ignition switch on, the, the start switch for the car on, either red, uh, yellow or the green, and a permanent live for the parking mode of the camera, which is live even with the car ignition um, turned off. But uh, I found out which was which, and uh, that's all explained in these, these next pictures. So if you look back at the picture from the handbook of the fuse box, um, the top right hand side of that picture, if you can imagine twisting that page 90 degrees to the left, 
So the picture is hanging down vertical and that top right hand side is now the top left hand side. So that is now fuse number one. And you can see on this picture uh, where fuse number one is. Uh, top left there, the orange 5 amp one. And then underneath it is uh, fuse number two, the 10 amp, and then number three, the 5 amp, and so on going down. So then skip along to the next um, column, vertically going down, where it's 5 amp, 5 amp, 10 amp. They are fuses 8 to 14. Third column along, where the top fuse is the, is the 15 amp, the blue one, that is fuses 15 to 23, and then the final row down, starting with the, uh, the 20 amp fuse at the top, uh, that fuses 24 to 33, you can see the numbers there. Now there are two blank spaces there from um, from the manufacturers, no fuse in there, positions 12 and 17. Now I could have tested these for permanent live and switched live and used these, but um, I prefer to leave them blank, they've been left blank by the manufacturer, whether that's you know the the computer the brain of it or whatever is expecting to see them blank i don't know so i prefer to leave them blank and utilize the others now any of the three of the four 30 amp fuses running down there on column three they're all the ones for the windows rear right rear left front right and front left and they are all permanently live so you can use any of them um, it shows which one I designed wanted to use. It's surprising how many permanent live fuses there were lying around. More than I thought. So it's up to you which one you use. But as long as you use the original fuse back in the right position, which is shown later, and the fuse for your dash cam, where it should go again, shown very soon. It's up to you which ones you use. One thing, the thing there at the bottom, just under the white fuse, is the fuse um, remover. It's like a little pair of tweezers. So uh, use that to uh, pull the fuses out. It's a bit hard to, to find, but that, that's where you'll find it. So here you uh, see the two piggyback connectors in their final position. Um, again, I've put all the stuff on screen, all the, the text. But uh, basically, the top one there is in the switched live position. That was the one that fed the front cigarette lighter socket on the car, which only becomes live when you turn the ignition on. Now, that goes to the yellow wire of the hard wiring kit that comes with it. The, the, I bought as an extra that uh, I show you during the instructions. So that's the switched live. That's the only one you'd normally use for most dash cams because they switch on and off with the ignition. This one, the hard wiring loom, has got the permanent live position, which is the one further down the fuse box there, um, into one of the electric window fuses, the 30 amp ones. Any, you could use any of them electric windows on, they're all permanently live. So that feeds the red wire of the hard wiring kit and that gives you your parking mode. Um, as explained earlier, this camera has got a parking mode so that when you switch the ignition off, so say you go to the supermarket, you switch the ignition off, you switch a switch off in the EV, you lock the doors, it transfers over then to the permanent life supply and you can set up the camera in various ways, time lapse or motion detection that will start the camera going and, and film anything that a bump or anything that's going on in the car park that you want so that's why you need the permanent live on this one so it's up to you which ones you use which of the fuses you use for switch lamp permanent live but that's that's my suggestion there the two i used so this is a close-up of one of the piggyback connectors um, again i've put everything on there that uh, you need to know uh, in text but basically you take the fuse out the main fuse out of the fuse box and you replace it in this piggyback connector in the position shown the lower with the orientated like that the lower of, of them two connections so that is then keeping the 30 amp fuse on the electric windows as it was designed 
the fuse above it the orange one you can see is a five amp fuse and that is to feed dash cam the permanent live or the uh, switched live whichever uh, piggyback one you're using uh, to the dash cam now these particular fuses i've used that orange fuse there i don't know whether you can see but there is like a lump on the top of it and they're pretty good um what happens is if this fuse blows that lights up so it's a great indication you could look at the fuse box and and see which fuse has blown when they're in the non-blown position they're just like any other fuse just just non-illuminated but when they actually uh, blow that little thing comes on so if you see a little uh, dot of orange light on top of the fuses you know that's the one that's blown and you don't have to go searching for it they're only a bit more than normal and they're readily available off, off the likes of ebay but any normal uh, car fuse that will fit uh, will do and uh, yeah basically if you orientate it as shown uh, like it mentions there there is like into the fuse box switch obviously the, the the receptacle that the fuse goes in the power comes in one through the fuse and out the other so one is the feed and one is the draw so it is important you put that you orientate that piggyback connector the right way around and if you do it the way i've done it in the diagrams that is the correct way around okay so just to confirm it we've got the ignition switch off now no lights are on whatsoever and on the two power feeds so i've got it connected to one of them now and we can see 12 volts that's on this left hand fitting there a left hand connection there so that's your permanent live and if we now put it in this one right we're now in the right one we can see there are no volts but if we turn the accessory switch on we've now got a voltage reading that's with it in the right one so it proves we've got a switched live and a permanent live okay so just to confirm now beyond all doubt i've got this um, camping light wired in to the switched live i've already confirmed the permanent live is definitely permanent and that's wired into the switched live and as you can see the switch is off there's no lights on there we've got no power to this as soon as i put that on accessory the light comes on as soon as we turn it off the light goes off so that's that so what i also want to confirm now is but the permanent live does indeed stay a permanent live so we've got that temporarily plugged into there and that's operating you can see that's off that is lit what i'm going to do now is shut the door and lock it and uh, go and have some dinner and come back in about an hour just to check that is still lit what i wanted to do this test for was i yes i'm getting a permanent live now but there are things that uh, stay on for a certain preset amount of time um, in some cars who knows you might get a permanent live but half an hour later it decides to turn itself off and uh, and it's not a permanent live but luckily here it is an hour later now and there you can see the light is is still glowing so yeah that's confirmed it for one hour there's nothing going to turn off turn off after one hour i would think but yeah that's confirmed it it's still permanent live an hour later so it's now just a, a case of crimping these two wires in with a pair of uh, crimps like this don't just use normal sort of pliers as you, as you crimp them because they, they never do the proper job use the proper
proper crimps with the setting on blue. They've got little blue and red dots on them. And as you squeeze them together, you can see it leaves the right amount in there. To clear the wires. We'll peel that off now. Powering it up. We're on the permanent live now. The permanent live is connected. But you see the the camera hasn't fired up because that's just to power the mode when it transfers over to it in parking mode. But as I turn the ignition switch on now, that should bring the camera on. And indeed it does. Yeah, the little chirp start up. And there is the picture. So, all done. We're just going to tidy this mess up now. And that's it from the front. See, I've got them coiled up and tied up there. The crimps are there. And all the other stuff is uh, tie wrapped back and poked there. And we've got the switch there. So we can easily change the, uh, the voltage under. For now I'm going to put it at 12.2 volts. So on the second one. All that remains now is to put the, put the glove box back. And we're all done. As you can see, the battery, the 12 volt battery, is still showing sort of 14 volts in the ready stage, so we had it on an hour running that little 8 watt neon light and it's still in the ready stage showing 14 volts camera there showing bloody bongs got our camera showing there uh, and the picture in picture and when we turn our ignition off off now that should go out as it has done ignition on we're just on that accessory position now and there it is going on okay so that's the uh, install with both cameras fully up and running but like I said at the beginning what happened was I when I was testing the uh, parking mode it was up my drive at night and every car that drove past the road and it was a very very windy night um, and anybody moving coming in and out the back door of our house going in front of the car was obviously setting the recording function off so the following morning I had absolutely loads and loads and loads of recorded files in the parking mode. So I thought, well, I don't want it on. I don't want the parking mode on while I'm parked at home. All I want it is when I'm out and about driving and I park it up for 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour or whatever, while I'm doing the shopping or whatever, just to monitor any possible damage I might get done to the car. I'm not bothered about it at home. I've got CCTV at home anyway. So... I could turn it off by get going into the menu of the camera and turning it off there or I could unplug the power lead from the top of the camera or even half slide the camera out of its out of its mount but all of them I don't want to be doing I don't want to keep sliding it in and out in and out of its mount and pulling the, the USB power lead out or messing about on turning going into the menu to turn the Wi-Fi on for the phone or going into the menu itself so I thought I would add one of these it's a switch that I'm going to mount inside the glove box connected to the permanent live supply so that most of the time I will leave it on so when I am about driving it will be on 
But when I arrive home at night, I can flick the uh, glove box open, click the switch, and it stops it doing the, the parking mode at night when I'm at home. Very, very shortly, I'm going to show you how I wired this in. Um, so we're starting from the whole thing wired in, how you would normally do it, and then I'm going to be cutting wires again to wire this in. Now, one word of warning. I had five of these, as you can see, these switches, from a previous... You can see them. From a previous project three or four years ago on my kit car. And I thought, great, I'll, I'll use one of them. They're a nice illuminated switch. So I went to the trouble of wiring all them in. I made this bracket. Again, I'll be showing you how I made this bracket and uh, what I made it out of. And soldered it all in, soldered all the wires on and everything. Comes to put it in the car, only to find I'd forgotten they are not latching type. But what you call momentary switches. I, you push them and they're on. When you let go, they're off. So they're only on when you're actually holding them, which, as you can appreciate, is absolutely useless. So I needed to get a latching switch. So I've been on Amazon. I've got all them from Banggood. And uh, the dirt cheap on Banggood. I got about 10 of them for this project and I have these, these four um, left over. And the dirt cheap on Banggood, but they take about a month to come if you've ever used it. So I do need this quick. So I've had to buy the bullet and pay a bit more through Amazon. So if we just have a look at here at um, Amazon. So if we look here, this is the, the one I've bought. It's a pair of these. I had soldered all the wires on the back of these existing switches I had. But you can get some with this back piece on, which is a connector, which makes it a lot easier because you can solder the connector onto the wires and then it just pushes on the back of the switch. So you can replace the switch dead easy if ever you need to. So I thought, sod it, since I'm having to buy um, buy one from Amazon, I'll, I'll, I'll get them with these connectors on. Uh, I bought two because it was nine ninety nine, as you see there, nine ninety nine uh, for two. It was something like seven quid for one, so th that's why I had to buy. Now this measurement here across the threads, as you see up here, it's sixteen mil, so that's the diameter. Now I'd already drilled and made the little bracket, and um, with a 16 mil hole in it so I was isolated to that they do it in 12 mil and they do it in 19 mil as well so what you're looking for is that word there latching that's very important so a latching one is one that when you push it in it stays on when you push it again it pops out like a normal switch would it stays in without you holding it in you get all the instructions with it, as you can see there, where to wire it up. But I'll show you on a little diagram the way it, it wires up and uh, what you'll need. And there you can see off and what well, it says no <laughs> means on, off and on. And that's all the dimensions of it. The blue thing at the bottom is the push on connector. It tells you if, if you want it, the LED, because they are illuminated. I've, I've bought some green ones, but you can get them in red and yellow and that. Um, you can have the light on when it's off, when the switch is in the off position, or the light on when it's in the on position. So there's various ways of, of wiring it up. Again, I'll go into detail of that very, very shortly when we, we get outside and we start wiring it into the car. So that's that. So if you had the switch on its own and they didn't have the blue uh, push-on connector that goes on the back, uh, you can wire it in direct. It just makes it easier to swap when you've got that connector. But if you want to wire it in di direct, this is what all them five pin switches look like. They're sometimes in a different arrangement than this, but they're, they're all labelled the same. So we've got one for common. That will be labelled C for common. We've got one... NO that's normally open and we've got one NC that's normally closed and then we've got the negative and the positive 
So the normally closed one is one you won't usually use. That's for when the switch is um, giving power to the whatever it is when it's sort of like in its off position normally, but then when you press it in and it illuminates, it kills power to the thing. So there's hardly any instances you, you'll want that. If you just want it to come light up when it's switched on and light up and the light out when it goes out, this is the way you do it. So you'd run a wire from the normally open, the NO position, and join that to the positive terminal. That then goes to the device so the dash cam in this case and then the ground from the device the negative goes to the negative of the switch as does and that goes to the battery so the negative all these negatives are joined together so that's basically the earth of your car so to any earth on your car you would join the negative from there from the switch to there and the the reason you need negative is because of the the light, the neon light, the LED light in the switch itself that lights up. And then your common at the top, that runs to the positive of your battery. So it's all there on that diagram, should you want to wire in one of them switches. It is a bit fiddly, uh, you've got to use a tiny little soldering iron. But uh, it can be done, as I showed you when I wired in the, the wrong one. Now, I made the bracket for it out of this. Again, it's just a bit of leftover white UPVC window trim from when I did the windows or something like that. And I made this little bracket. So I don't know whether you can see it. I'll show you some pictures of it. And I just heated this stuff up with a heat gun bent it to this angle and I'll show you where that goes in the glove box in a minute drilled a 16 mil hole through it to mount the switch and like I say you can see I've soldered all the wires ready on here I thought I was going to complete the entire job today took it to it and found out it's a not on latching switch an idiot so uh, it's not a rounded off the bottom with some uh, sand, a sanding block and this glues into the glove box where I'll show you very very shortly so that's the bracket I made again you can mount it you don't have to use one of these uh, you can mount it in the glove box any way you like like I say if you've got a big enough micro SD card it doesn't fill the whole card, even at the end of that, even though there's loads of little triggers, it only films for like 15 seconds in front of the event itself and then 30 seconds after. So if it goes off again five minutes later, it's 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 not filling too much of the card up, but there are lots and lots and lots of files and uh, I just it's just pointless uh, using it at night at home. So, so when I get home, I'm just going to pull the glove box down, click that switch off, and it's off and then the following day click it on let's go uh, to the car now and i'll show you how i've wired that in and uh, where i'm going to mount it here's the instructions you get with the little switch so there's the switch and the bracket that comes with it i've curled up the white wire which is the normally open wire because i won't need that but i didn't want to cut it off I guess I need it in the future for something else. So I've just coiled that on with a bit of tape at the back. And uh, then I'll just be wiring these to here. So on this one here, the green wire will go to, which well shows the battery, so that'll go to the fuse. So the output from the fuse will go to this green. And then the black is the earth, so that will go to the ground of the car because it goes to the negative of the battery and the negative of the device, the dash cam. And then the red and the yellow are joined together. There's one with a common, one of the red with a common. 
and then they go to the positive of the device and that as it mentioned above here that will come on when I push the button it will send power to the dash cam to the parking mode constant supply and the neon light will light up green and when I turn it off the light will go out and it will kill the power so uh, we'll just do that then and then I'll show you it working okay so uh, there's the bracket with the switch on it and the adapter on the back like I say I've just taped the white that's the normally open connector not something I'd ever normally use but I've just coiled it up there and taped it at the back in case I ever do the green which has got a male push on crimp on terminal now that ma that green male goes to the fuse the inline fuse which will be put, put in back last I've ha had to extend you can see the black cable on the plug didn't go quite far enough so I've extended that with a piece of uh, earth wire because it is negative earth ready to go around the earth spot and the black and the yellow as per the diagram should be the common and the normally closed goes to that uh, female connector and that then connects here which is the supply up to the uh, the dash cam so that's it, so all we've got to do now is uh, hot glue that bracket under here like that. and we'll show it you working okay so there it is all, all in place um, it's quite firm on that bracket now if I press it you'll see it's green so that's the way I'll be leaving it um, most of the time it's just when I arrive home at night that's when I can click it off like that and it won't be doing any park mode filming at home and then when you want it to do it just uh, click it on like that I forgot to mention if you didn't want to use one of the illuminated type switches you could just use a simple toggle switch like this off and on and it's just got two connections so that would be a simple matter of just snipping the the wire going up to the uh, the dash cam the red wire, the park mode permanent 12 volt wire and inserting that in its way and then you could flick it on or flick it off but of course it doesn't give any indication of which way around it is and you'd wonder whether it was on or off unless you'd labelled it coming out of the dash or something like that so I think it looks uh, it looks better with with that in position there if this had have been an old car what I would have done is I would have drilled this bracket here uh, just to the just to the side there there's plenty of room for the switch there um, I wouldn't have had to make this separate bracket but I didn't want to start it's a one month old car, I don't want to start drilling holes in it if it has to go back under warranty and things like that there, uh, and it doesn't look great when you do eventually come to sell it that you've drilled a hole in it because when I sell it obviously this lot will be coming out and I can just on hot glue that bracket and job's done so on, off, leave it off for now so I've taped all these wires up out of the way and put the glove box back now and we're all done so we've got that uh, switch in there now so we can turn off the parking mode uh, if if we need it so yet yeah, a note to Viofo if you're watching this anybody from Viofo a great feature to add to the camera would be a little switch just on the side a dedicated switch that turns parking mode on and off without having to delve into the 
the menu or anything like that, or even a switch on the, the base, the GPS base thing that's connected to the permanent live, um, just so you can, you can kill that permanent live if you need to manually. Right, so we're now going to look at some of the test videos from it. Now, there are quite a few, and I know it's been an extremely long uh, video, this, but hopefully doing it in great detail will show you absolutely everything. And you can always fast forward it if, if you're getting bored. But I'm going to go now into all the actual uh, video footage, and I'll be showing you uh, the front camera, the front new 4K camera, in day and night and without the polarizing filter and with the polarizing filter during day and night. I'll be showing you the rear one at day and night. I've not bothered with the, uh, putting the polarizing filter on that so that's just a, a comparison between day and night of the rear one. And I will also put some comparisons up of the older one, the 2K A1119 which I used to have in my Ford. Uh, I'll probably utilise that in the kit car or something like that, but uh, I'll keep hold of that for now. So there will be plenty and plenty of videos, hopefully some of them split screen as well, so you can directly compare them. And we'll, uh, we'll go into uh, comparing them now. So uh, here's the footage. First of all, we've got the, the front 4K cam with wide dynamic range off and the polarising filter on. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference on the front camera with wide dynamic range on or off. But if you freeze it, you might be able to see a bit more colour in the shadows. Um, see what you think when you, you see it coming up. Now this is the same front 4K cam with the wide dynamic range on. And again, the polarising filter is on. And um, not a lot of difference with the uh, WDR on or off on the front camera. Now this is the WDR on and this time a polarising filter off. Um, you can see, if you look at the top right, there's like a little reflection there that wasn't there before. And further down just above the words like 4k cam you can see that flickering reflections on or off that that weren't there before so it does seem that the polarizing filter is definitely uh, cutting down on, on glare uh, later on there'll be an, like an on off here we are on and off so you can see you can compare the two there filterizing filter on filter off filter on filter off now this is the rear camera, which is 1080p, remember, with the wide dynamic range off. And this one, you really can see the difference. If you look how dark, particularly that the trees there were on the right-hand side and there, there is a lot of dark shadows where it's hard to distinguish what's, uh, what's in them. But shortly when you see the WDR on, here we are with the WDR on, you can see that is a lot more balanced um, there's more detail in them trees it's not so many dark shadows and it's not blowing anything out skywise either so definitely a wide dynamic range on is a setting to go on now this is the 2k camera the old one the Viofo A119 the one I used to have, well, not the one I still have, but the one I used to use on, on the Ford Focus. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty good. But uh, not quite as good as the 4K, obviously. And we'll show that at, uh, very soon in a, a blow-up of a, a number plate where you can see the difference. So there, that's the screen grab of the 4K cut footage, zoomed 600%. And you can easily read that number plate. But shortly when you see the same from the 2K footage, taken from exactly the same place, you'll see it's nothing like as readable. So there I've stopped the film in exactly the same place. And that's it. Zoomed in again to 600% and you can see it's um, 
it's illegible you can't tell what my number plate is so that shows the importance of 4k you can zoom in on things like distant number plates without losing uh, any detail so there you can see uh, just uh, one above the other 4k on the top 2k on the bottom make your own mind up which is clearer obviously the 4k is, is the better footage particularly when you zoom in so here's the nighttime footage first of all the 4k front cam with no polarizing filter driving from sort of like yellow lights towards white lights you can see there's plenty of detail there some might say on the internet it's a bit overexposed but uh, i think it's better that way than darker and you can see more detail um, now here we have it with the polarizing filter on you can see there's less flashes at bottom left hand side if you go back to the other one you will see the reflections of the dash a lot more on the uh, one with the uh, without it but it does seem a bit crisper without the filter somehow but the filter will be staying on right this is the rear one uh, equally as good sort of looking pictures really at night you're not going to get the full advantage of the 4k resolution at, at night in, in low light conditions really but uh, so still looking pretty good and pretty bright and uh, finally this is the the older 2k a double nine cam uh, much darker as you can see and uh, you can alter the exposures on each camera individually front and back but of course that would uh, alter it for daytime use as well so uh, i'll stick with it as it is so these are two parking mode videos starting with the front camera as you can see it started recording before i appeared it's not always it's for what it claims it's 15 or it's 30 seconds or whatever it is but it cams up very a bit but it did start before i appeared and it's uh, it's videoing me now as you can see and even though i move off screen this is it in real time it carries on for i think it says in the book 30 seconds that is like a preset time it picked me up again there so it might extend it a bit but it carries on recording after motion has finished for a, a preset time and you see it, it did work there now this is the rear camera you see over the road there's a postman there now i don't think that was sensitive enough to set it off but this car passing now this taxi was the one that would have um, triggered the motion detection but it did start as you saw before it appeared that's the buffering showing that the buffering is working bit more movement from the postman there and it carries on for a you know a fixed amount of time so i'll say 15 or 30 seconds like i say it does seem to vary that but it does carry on for a lot of time so as you see it does detect the motion uh, it records before the motion is actually there and carries on for a bit afterwards so that seems fine now once you've taken the sd card out and put it in your uh, your, your pc this is how the files look you'll see that uh, if it's got an f if you see the very top file there has got an f after the number that means it's from the front camera and straight underneath it is r for the rear camera they're in mp4 and then it tells you the date and the time they were taken and the size of that file now if you go down to like the third one down that's the next f1 that's the full three minutes i've got this set at three minute file sizes so that's what it takes and you can see that the full three minutes at full 4k resolution for the front camera is 900,000 kilobytes and 300,000 for the rear 1080p camera now you can add them two together and divide them into 128 million because that's how many kilobytes there are in a gigabyte and that will tell you how many minutes worth of normal sort of driving footage you can get on a 128 gigabyte card and the answer is give or take a few minutes about five hours so you've got five hours of recording at full 4k at the front and 1080p at the back when it reaches the end that's how much you can get on a 128 gig card when it reaches the end of that it will start rubbing the first ones off so uh, 
still for uh, anything but the very very longest journey that, that's going to be ample at full high resolution so as we go down here we then come to this small file here well you can see that has got a p if you go over to the uh, the numbers again that's got a p supplement after the f uh, before the f and a p supplement before the r well they're the park mode files so that's when the car was not running the door was shut and the ignition was off and they're only 42,000 kilobytes long each because they're only if you remember the uh, motion sensitive uh, part mode it comes on for 30 seconds it records on a buffer and it records 30 seconds before it detects motion then it detects the the motion bit and then uh, 15 seconds after the, the motion has finished just does about 30 seconds of that motion if it carried on a lot of uh, movement and that it'd do another file straight after it but it keeps them files at a more manageable size 42,000 thing otherwise if it take them at uh, full resolution it, it would uh, take a, a hell of a lot more space up so that's with the parking mode set to motion sensitive and you'll see that most of the files are the full driving files, the 900 and the 300 and 900. You can set it to take to record any amount of uh, file from one minute to ten minutes. And once it's do it's recorded that one minute or two minute or three minute or whatever you set it at, it then starts recording another file. And they are seamless. You can put them together in editing, and there's no gaps whatsoever. But it just splits them all up, and it makes it easier to find an incident that happened at a certain time so I've picked three minutes as a, as a good compromise now this one shows the parking mode set at low bitrate now this isn't set off by motion so as soon as you park your car up and uh, turn the ignition off it starts recording continuously now you can appreciate if if it was in normal resolution that would take up a hell of a lot of space continuous uh, recording so when you set that low bit rate it records right down uh, a much much lower bit rate so you can see again they are three minute files and in, like I said it's continuous recording it's not set off by movement so uh, whether there was movement or not it would be cont continuously recorded for an hour or, or whatever you parked up for it's, again splitting it into three minute segments as you can see now the front and the back are both um, the same size because it's lowering the bitrate. They do still look pretty good, the footage. Uh, it's not blurred or pixelated by any means. Obviously it couldn't stand zooming in like the full 4K could, but it's perfectly good to, to look at and much, much smaller file sizes. So if you look, you, you've got 90,000 kilobytes for three minutes, i.e. 30 thousand kilobytes is one minute and i worked that out and would take 71 hours to fill a 128 gig card so obviously you've got your, your driving footage as well at the full resolution taking up more space but if you did surveillance for a long long time you could set that up and it continuously say you were at an event and you knew you were going to park up for an hour and you wanted to see everything happening um, even when there's no movement maybe movement in the distance which, which wouldn't set the the camera off you could set it on this and it would take the full one hour's worth and not take that much room up 71 hours of non-stop filming at that bit rate on a 128 gigabyte card hopefully you made it to the end i know it's a marathon video uh, an hour and a half ish long this one and a half an hour for part one uh, if you haven't seen part one by the way click this link up up, up here or watch one of the, the, the links on the end screen um, part one takes you through the unboxing of the dash cam and the, uh, some of the features of it and the reasons why I picked it and the, the tools and materials that you'll need for this install video but uh, this has been the main video the reason it was so long is because I have been asked to do one and in as much detail as possible I know some people appreciate every single nut and bolt how to take it out so that's 
that's what I've tried to do every panel that you need to take out and all, all the parts and wiring and everything so that's the reason it's so long if it is too long for you just skim through to the bit that might, might uh, interest you and hopefully it will be some of some use if you're fitting your own dash cam now the footage at the end the jury is out on the polarizing filter it's it, it is it is of use but uh, at night i prefer the footage at night without it uh, but I'm, i'll be keeping it on it does re cut back reflections during the day the wdr the wide dynamic range as you saw was much more effective on the rear camera the 1080p camera than the 4k but the footage from the 4k is really really nice footage you can zoom in as shown 600% on, a, on a, a reasonably distant car and still read the number plate and that's quite important because that's what dash cams are all about identifying cars in, in the event of an accident and that so um, the more resolution you've got the better and the better holiday videos and things it will make anyway so like I said with the first camera I'm really really pleased with the VR4 cameras and uh, I'm glad I chose this one so hopefully you've made it to the very very end like i say and hopefully it's been of some use if you want to subscribe to the channel click the uh, subscription the picture of the shed here and subscribe and uh, you'll be notified of uh, videos when i post them there's loads more coming i'll be doing loads more on the mg zs ev for various things i do to it I will be doing continue to do the tool reviews i've got one that i've got to do yet lined up for a power washer that i just bought this week from lidl's so i'll be doing a review on that uh, and like i say every sort of gadget i get or 99 percent of the gadgets and tools i buy i will be doing a review on as well as uh, carrying on with all the bits of info on the MG ZS EV. So hopefully I can catch you for some of them and thanks for watching this one. See you all again soon. Bye for now.